Bienvenidos al ciclo especializado de formación, trabajo, salud y estrés realizado. Welcome por... to our specialized cycle of health, stress and work by Sura, the group of research of Los Andes, Prax and the Center for Social Epidemiology. I mean, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, formation cycle. Please remember that this cycle has four thematic axes, 10 conferences from the four uh, countries, nine experts, and has 15 hours of training for you. We have the pleasure of having over 1,500 participants from over 700 companies and 114 economical activities, and we hope to positively impact the conditions, the working conditions of over 600,000 workers that are part of those 747 companies that are participating in this cycle. Remember, if you want to hear the conference, the, the talk in, an, in a language different than the original language, this today, this talk is going to be in Spanish. So I don't think you're going to have any uh, trouble. You don't need to activate uh, translation. But if you want to listen to it in English, we're going to have an English translation. So you could activate that option by selecting English. If you have any comments or ideas um, that you want to share with the participants or with the group of panelists, please remember you can do that through the chat. We thank you. If, if you, any questions that you want to ask our invited uh, uh, guest today, if you have questions for him, then do it through the option of questions and answers. There, Viviola Gomez, Dr. Viviola Gomez, my, my colleague, she's going to be reading all of those questions and organizing them so that at the end of the conference, we can ask those questions. Attendance will be taken at the end of the event through a form you will find uh, in the chat, if you attended the whole cycle, you will receive a special certificate. And if you didn't, you will receive a certificate for each of the talks you attended. And a couple of hours after this event ends, we're going to have a recording available in English and in Spanish in our webpage. And all of this information is also going to be available to YouTube uh, practice YouTube challenge and next week you'll receive an email where you will be able to see all the talks in English and all the talks in Spanish. Now I hand the floor to Dr. Viviola Gomez. She is the leader of the pedagogical uh, proposal for this formation cycle and she's going to present our guest today. So Viviola, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Sebastian. It's my pleasure to say hi to everyone today. Today, it's a very special pleasure for me to introduce our guest because our guest today is David Hurtado. And as you can see, he is a psychologist and anthropologist of Los Andes University. And so as such, he was my student back in the day. He, as I was uh, saying, uh, he's one of the most brilliant students I've ever had. David says, I am responsible uh, for him being interested in these topics. And then he went on to Harvard University to get his doctorate degree, PhD. And he is now a teacher um, in the Oregon University. Today, he is a member of one of these special centers uh, financed by NIOSH that I was mentioning in, in another talk, because Laura Ponet also has one of the centers. So I don't want to take up too much time. I'm just going to hand the floor to him. He's going to have a chance to share his experience. David, it's our pleasure to have you here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. And I didn't say you were, you were responsible, but you were to blame for my career. So that's even worse. But thank you so much, um, because my, my life, my academic life um, went on to studying all of these topics 
thanks to you. And I think that the commitment I have as a professional and as a person to improving the conditions, working conditions and, and health conditions for everyone is very meaningful. So please uh, confirm if you see my presentation. Not yet. Okay, while I share my screen. Do I have to do something or? You should be able to just share your screen. Okay, now. Yeah, now we're saying your screen. Okay, there's something that I think uh, I need to correct in the presentation, which is that the, next to my picture, there's an American flag, but it should be the Colombian flag. I understand where we have this flag of the United States because my academic life, life has developed in the United States, but I am Colombian, of course, I'm speaking Spanish, um, but even though I don't research topics that are very Colombian, I do want to start by saying that I celebrate the fact that this cycle is happening because when I was a student, a Vidiola student 15 years ago, I think, we never had the chance of being surrounded in Colombia by so many professors and teachers that are so important in this area. So it's a privilege for me to be closing this cycle that has been presented by the most important people in the world. So it's a pride for me really uh, to have to have this opportunity uh, and to be here with the Colombian audience. That really indicates that we are gaining, we are, we're making gains and, and there has been a generational change since I was studying with Viviola. So congratulations Viviola and Sebastian and everyone who's here for for being here. So this is going to be the content of my presentation is in English, but I'm going to be speaking in Spanish. So I apologize if, if I have to read and, and translate. Of course, we have a professional translator who's uh, doing a back translation uh, simultaneously. But if you have a question in English, I'm also available to answer it in English. Okay, so the topic, I'm going to start. The topic of my presentation is organizational interventions with a focus on supervisors to try to improve the health of workers or the integration of work and personal life. Here, uh, Viviola already mentioned a little bit about my background, but I want to mention that currently I am an assistant professor of the Oregon Institute of Occupational Health and Sciences, and uh, it is located in Oregon, and there I am a teacher of the Occupational Health Sciences and of the School of Public Health. I am an anthropologist and a uh, psychologist, of Los Andes University. I finished my master's degree and my PhD in Harvard University. And from there, I have been researching inter in organizational interventions to try to improve the health of workers. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that this has been a terrible year because of the pandemic. Currently, I am in Bogota. I am visiting my family and my wife's family. And the truth is that it's a miracle that we can be here. It's a miracle that at least our close family has been relatively well. But the pandemic has been a really strong um, um, problem for the whole of humanity. There has been suffering and struggling. And the people I know here in Colombia have been affected closely by the pandemic. So I want to take a moment to um, acknowledge how traumatic these past 15 months have been. One of the hardest things from the point of view of occupational health is the challenges 
that the pandemic has imposed on occupational health. And those are challenges that have affected, of course, all, all of the employees, but also supervisors and people who are responsible for guaranteeing the health, health and safety at work. I'm talking about unemployment, people who have lost their job temporarily, a lot of uh, uncertainty. It's a pandemic that every month or every three months uh, changes completely the situation is a new situation so some things that we need to take into account now that we supposedly are getting back to normal quote unquote is that the pandemic has erased previous barriers that we had regarding space and time a lot of us are working from home and that has meant that workers especially those who have a care responsibility for kids or for the elder that has really impacted their lives. And uh, additionally, we are now sharing more information about health than what we did before the pandemic. Nevertheless, I wouldn't say this is a positive aspect because the pandemic has brought a lot of suffering, but the pandemic has highlighted the importance of occupational health or work. And so all, all of the positions, uh, working positions have been forced to implement control measures for the control of, of the spread of the virus. And there has been really important information about uh, PPE, protective personal equipment, especially for healthcare workers and also since we established that the virus could be uh, transmitted through aerosols, then we've had highlighted the importance of environmental controls, especially ventilation and uh, physical barriers. And as I mentioned previously, there are a lot of um, uh, managerial decisions such as remote work, separate work, changing in schedules, and something that has happened in the United States regarding the lack of sick, um, uh, paid leave, paid sick leave. So um, the pandemic has forced a lot of changes uh, in terms of occupational health. And one of the things that we always need to bear in mind is that the pandemic, it's going to exacerbate health, mental health problems at work that before the pandemic were already serious. The World Health Organization has established that around 10% of the global population has been affected by a mental disease at one point of their life. I'm talking about depression, anxiety, one of the leading causes uh, of disability that's before they uh, plan to retire. And mental health are precursors or consequences or of other comorbidities. But one of the most important challenges and harder challenges when you are a researcher trying to improve health at work is that mental health problems are manifesting in very different ways. The most classic one is negative emotions. When you can see a worker with their head down, that's one of the signs. Uh, there are other direct and indirect consequences. For example, being absent from work when people ask for permission, what we call sick days in the United States, when you just call and say, I'm not going to work today. And presentism, which I don't know how uh, to say it in, in Spanish, but I suppose you've seen it in this cycle. And that's the phenomenon that you are at school. No, no, not at school. I'm thinking about my daughter's school. So you go to work and um, because of health reasons, you might be there at work, but you're not being productive because the emotional or your health burden can be too much and might be affected your your performance that's why we talk about low performance and then uh, most most serious things that have um, more measurable costs for the organization which are turnover when people um, quit and when they receive um, the bill from the insurance that, that says how many of the services they used
The following statistics come from the United States, but the cost, annual costs of um, mental illness in the workplace are millionaire. We're talking about billions of dollars or trillions of dollars. Um, it's greater than the whole budget of Colombia for a year. A lot of the costs of mental health are attributed to low productivity, unemployment, disability, and low performance. And another important point to take into account regarding mental health in work at the workplace is that there's a stigma. So most of the people who are affected by mental health issues, whether they don't talk about it with anyone else, they do not um, disclose it, they don't reveal it or manifest it at work because they are scared of retaliation or they simply don't access any treatment. So there's a problem of stigmas that are stopping people from talking about that or from receiving proper treatment. So with that introduction, the contents of my presentation today are going to be based in three tactics based on evidence about how supervisors can improve the mental health of workers. I'm going to talk about three strategies that may be taken as independent strategies or complementary strategies. And uh, each and every one of them, I'm going to present them uh, at um, incremental levels of complexity. Before we start with our three strategies, I wanna give you a couple of basic definitions. When I talk about supervisors, I'm going to use the term supervisor or manager um, interchangeably as synonyms, and I'm going to talk about supervisors, uh, direct supervisors, especially. We're going to talk about studies that are regarding people who have a supervisor title, so they have formal authority. And because of that, they have a difference in powers. There's a difference of power between the supervisor and employees. And that means that that, that person can hire and fire and that person can determine the tasks and has a direct influence on people's stress but that power also includes responsibilities and accountability especially regarding safety a good supervisor is responsible from of guaranteeing that the work is going to be safe Nevertheless, I'm going to mention on the side or briefly situations or studies where the intervention is carried out mainly in the leadership of a team, which is important, but they don't have that formal authority that supervisors do have. I'm not going to mention studies, even though much of my all researches are based in informal leaders. So these workers whose reputation have an impact on health and safety of other workers. And I'm also not going to mention studies that have based on uh, committee representatives, for example, the Occupational Health Committee. But I am going to make a couple of comments about this that I'm not going to mention directly. Okay, so for this presentation, as the title was saying, I'm going to base my, uh, the presentation on interventions. I'm going to leave aside observational studies or coordinational studies, especially those that just apply a, a survey and relate a variable of that survey with a variable of health. Those studies are important, but it's much more convincing and complex and powerful the evidence, in my opinion, that comes from interventions. Those efforts that researchers do to try to change things in the practice. So I'm going to talk about interventions that are developed within organizations where the focus is our supervisors. Something happens to trying to change 
the behavior of a supervisor and then as a consequence the health or any other variable uh, for workers. I'm not going to be talking about individual approaches to reduce stress. I'm not going to talk about studies that are based on relaxation techniques, mindfulness techniques. How do you say mindful? It's in Spanish. Well, when I think mindfulness, yeah, there's no translation, David. Okay, from self-care and other breathing techniques and those sorts of things. I'm not going to talk about either about clinical studies where workers have been a part of a, a clinical trial. And the studies I, I am going to mention are include, they have been evaluated in, in terms of the impact it had over psychological health or other ways that manifest uh, mental health problems, for example, if people stop going to work or if they uh, search or look for professional health. A big part of my research is based on the healthcare industry. And that's the literature I know best. So that's why I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more. So that is a bias I have to recognize. Methodologically speaking, as I mentioned, I'm only going to talk about interventions studies that have uh, carried out interventions. I try to mention only studies that have had an experimental design. So the intervention has been assigned randomly. Or if that is not possible, as many times is the case in organizational sciences uh, and other methods, especially with uh, control conditions. And I mentioned that I'm going to talk about studies that intervene at a supervisor level, but the impact of the intervention is established or measured at uh, the workers level. So it's a multi-level design. Okay, so as I was saying, I'm not going to talk about individual approaches, but I do want to make a caveat here. If every individual decides on their own to meditate, and implement these relaxation techniques and uh, other mindfulness techniques. And that is, that is something that is going to be really positive. Nevertheless, what's not effective is when organizations respond to work stress with exclusively this sort of approaches. This is a systemic uh, review of a lot of interventions, individual interventions in the work context that showed that really the effect is um, on the long term uh, almost zero. So I want to mention this. If I, I do this personally, if I as a person decide to meditate or count to 10 before I speak, that is going to be really, really good. And I recommend it for anyone. But I don't recommend because it's not effective because the evidence shows this, is that if my employer decides the, the response for my stress at work is for me to count to 10, then that's not going to be effective. Okay, so the first tactic is educating or training supervisors on the importance of mental health in the workplace. So something I wanna say here is that most of the studies I'm going to mention are for mental health training, but a lot of these principles may be applied also to topics regarding integration, integrating work and personal life. So why is it important to train supervisors on the importance of mental health? For a lot of reasons. Firstly, supervisors play a very important role in shaping the social norms and the practices in the workplace. If you have a supervisor that is compassionate, that understands the personal situation of each worker, then that is going to be a very different workplace from uh, a supervisor that has a more authoritarian style. Um, but we need to take into account that supervisors themselves can be a cause of stress. So if you train or educate a supervisor 
regarding what causes stress in the workplace or what causes health problems in the workplace, then maybe that's going to make them realize and, and change their practices. Another important thing is that supervisors are the ones that facilitate or, um, or make it impossible for people to access resources or um, seek help. And supervisors need to uh, authorize uh, permissions, for example, to go to the doctors. So that's why supervisors need to understand the importance of mental health in the workplace. Now I'm going to show you a series of interventions, international interventions that have applied these principles to evaluate the mental health of workers. This is a study that we carried out uh, that was carried out in Australia within uh, first line personnel, uh, fire and rescue service. It evaluated the impact of a program that was called RESPECT. Uh, this is the acronym for RESPECT. I wrote it down here. And I wrote it down here. So it means regular contact, early communication, um, supporting an empathetic uh, communication, practical help, where the supervisor is not trying to be a psychoanalyst for the employee, um, but they, it encourages uh, professional help seeking behaviors, consider options and any measure or accommodation that needs to be done when a person needs to be absent to seek for professional help or when they return to work after treatment and telling them the door is always open. So this is a study that had ex an experimental design with 128 managers from 128 stations where a randomly uh, assigned allocated and this uh, study was made face to face with small groups. One of the things that I like about this study is that it evaluated the impact on the lost hours of work. So the hours that were lost because of sick time. So when a fireman calls or asks for a sick day or a day off because they are too stressed, then that is a problem, of course, for the person that's stressed, but also for the team. Because as you know, as you know a fire pe firemen don't work uh, standard hours. They work uh, sometimes 24 or 48 hours in a row. So if someone calls and says, I'm not going to work today because I'm sick, that is going to affect the safety and integrity of the whole team. So trying to reduce uh, lost hours is very, very important. And what was shown uh, is was that in six months, based on these uh, interventions, it reduced in almost six hours the sick time, while in the control group, it, it, it even increased in that same period. So this is a very good example of how to how training supervisors can reduce one of the ways in which um, health and stress in the workplace are manifested. This other study, it's carried out by one of my colleagues. Uh, right now, Jennifer Timov uh, was in her university carrying out her doctorate, but she was my colleague in Portland. She specializes in developing trainings for supervisors regarding mental health. But the focus of her work, of Dr. Dimov's work, is trying to get supervisors to identify which are the resources or the services or the services that exist in their organization so that employers can access them and try to improve their mental health. Um, her training also is based on how to show a more compassionate supervision that's more friendly, but within professional parameters, because this is one of the consequences or problems, uh, undesirable consequences uh, of this, because you don't want the supervisor to um, get too involved in the personal life of people, right? But uh, the training is oriented to getting the supervisor to be more receptive 
if someone decides to talk about these mental health problems, personal mental health problems. So the research of Dr. Dimov was carried out with office workers, white collar workers in Canada in four organizations. This is another experimental study and the intervention itself uh, was based on trainings, sessions or seminars, lectures that uh, regarding the importance of mental health and how mental health is manifested. What are the signs of stress, anxiety, burnout, depression, and uh, substance abuse? And uh, the truth is that this intervention had mixed effect because as you can see in the graphs, most of the variables didn't change or didn't improve regarding the control group. But the only effect that we found for the information was precisely in one of the most uh, important things of this intervention, which was that the supervisor is to facilitate um, that any employee can access help professional mental health to try to improve their mental health. And the last study I'm going to mention was carried out in Japan. It also had a training for supervisors um, format. Um, and this is different from the two previous I mentioned because the, the other two were, were done face-to-face, -face, but this one was carried out uh, digitally through computers. This was um, general training about mental health and also started to um, approach what is the role of the supervisor in the causes of stress in the workplace. With this chart, you can see that really the intervention was not effective. The only thing that changed was the employees um, employees perceive that their supervisors were more receptive and open to talking about uh, health issues. So we didn't see any effects on the health of workers, but we could at least improve these precursor variables. So as a summary, these trainings for supervisors are trying to trying to train supervisors so that they know more about consequences of treatments of mental health and how to um, to treat mental health of workers are effective because they increase or improve knowledge and attitudes so the stigma is reduced and they also facilitate the access to services or resources that can improve mental health of workers. But as I mentioned, there are mixed effects when we evaluate the direct impact on the health of workers. Most of the studies I found, uh, I, I have where I have studied, although here I'm only presenting three of them, uh, were short term. It, they lasted less than a year, except for the study of firemen in Australia, because most of the studies or interventions that have been carried out in this matter are what we call a, on white collar workers and uh, there are very few on blue collar workers and there's a need to examine the effective the, how effective these um, interventions are in more diverse industries for the type of work uh, done and for the people who work in different industries and we need to make greater emphasis on the interpersonal or organizational causes of stress and uh, health problems, mental health problems. The second tactic to, to improve the mental health of workers is to train supervisors on improving their supportive skills so that they become better supervisors. And why is this important? I don't know if you're in Colombia, you have these, uh, oh much, but what we say in the States that people do not quit their job, they quit their supervisor or their boss. And I was saying people not, don't get boring, bored about their work, but uh, just get bored or tired of their boss. And something that surprises me working in hospitals and in the work health sector is that people who, to 
reach the level of supervisors have never received formal training on how to be a good supervisor. They are just promoted because they have done the job for a lot of long time and they have done it well, but being the leader of a team requires interpersonal skills that people who have this disposition because of their personality could benefit from this. But of course, there's a lack of formal training on how to be a good supervisor. And those trainings generally emphasize uh, interpersonal skills and communication skills of leaders. Regarding this topic, there is a lot of theory on how to be a good supervisor. I'm just here mentioning three theoretical frameworks so that you can find evidence about them in terms of intervention that have examined the impact of these sorts of approaches for leadership and um, supervisors. This is why uh, I'm talking about this, because there are a lot of theories, uh, theories of author uh, being authoritative or the lesser fair, but I think that these three are the only ones, at least that I think, have a direct impact on workers' health. The first one is transformational leadership, one of the most studied um, theories in organizational sciences and occupational sciences. And uh, transformational leadership is defined generally or is contrasted with transactional leadership. Transactional leadership is a, a quid pro quo. Uh, it's this sort of leadership where the supervisor treats their subordinate. If I do this, you do that. And that as such is not bad because on the one hand it's reciprocity, but reciprocity, but when it is based uh, only on uh, extrinsic motivation. And so for the supervision paradigm, the supervisor uh, it sees themselves as the person who has to bring the solutions as the responsible one, as the fixer, uh, the guru. Wow. In transformational supervisor, there's an emphasis in the sort of vision that the leaders can establish in the sort of more than the achievement, the focus is on the process. Indicators, um, behavioral indicators are not necessarily for achievement. And the idea is to motivate or trying to find what motivates each worker in order to develop intrinsic motivation and it emphasizes inter interpersonal relationships. There is a lot of evidence uh, that apply surveys in organizations where employees describe if their supervisor has um, more transactional or transformational uh, characteristics, and then they correlate the data of those surveys with the variables of the health of the employer, of the employee. And so there is a lot of evidence for these sorts of studies, but the evidence is, becomes more scarce when the researchers try to go to an organization and um, take a supervisor who is not necessarily a transformational leader, give them some training to come to make them into a transformational leader and then evaluate if that new type of supervision has an impact on the health of workers. That, that information is more scarce, but I did find a good example with mixed results. This is another straight Another study by Kevin Calloway, who was the main or senior researcher for the um, uh, studies I mentioned of Jennifer Ginov in, in Canada. This is a research that was carried out in 21 care, um, care facilities for senior citizens. And it had a design where it was multifactorial. Uh, the first condition was uh, there was a workshop, a four-hour workshop, where researchers met with the supervisors to discuss if the, their own behaviors or fictional behaviors could be um, qualified as transactional or transformational. 
and then they debated how to show a transformational leadership. That was the workshop they carried out. The first aleatory condition was to use those techniques of the workshop, but applying them only to occupational health. So how to be a good leader in terms of occupational health and um, the problems that can affect or end up being a, an injury or an accident or something like that. The second condition is the benefits of this sort of leadership and apply to general areas of the organization beyond safety to human resources, permissions, interpersonal relationships, and the control group did not receive any of these. They just carried out business as usual. This intervention really did not have any effects. And one of the things that the authors discuss is that it's very hard to try to make someone into a transformational leader unless they already have a personality that leans towards that. This is another study, interventional study, that used principles of transformational leadership to try to improve the abilities of supervisors. But the context of this intervention is something that we need to take into account because it was carried out in military personnel in the UK. And so authority in the in that world is something that's very important. And being a supervisor implies a formal authority level that's much more serious than in other countries. But they tried to improve the skills the leadership skills of these military leaders under the theory of transformational leadership. They carried out workshops where they observed behaviors and they carried out ex open question exercises where they received feedback and they set collective goals. In this study, if you look at the chart at the end, soldiers reported that their resilience increased. That was their self-reports, uh, how much they believe they can resist or go back to the basal level if they experience something traumatic. And lastly, uh, the people who work in occupational health might be more familiarized with this this theory of leadership which is a theory of a relational or authentic leadership it's, it's more recent than the two previous ones and it originates in several scandals that happen in organizations where they realize that leaders had morally reproachable behaviors and that's why we talk about being authentic Relational authentic leadership are two different things, but they are very linked together. They have similar principles and that's why I mentioned them at the same time. But the idea is that you focus on two things. One, the skills, their personality in terms of transparency. And the idea is to promote trust, having self-awareness and self-discipline. And from the practical point of view, it's, it focuses on communication abilities. So what we call soft skills, soft skills that is about reflected in assertive communication and uh, also in reflective listening, what we, where we listen with all of our senses. These are images from a systemic review of studies in the healthcare sector. And as you can see, the sort of interventions that they applied were interventions based on coaching and trying to improve interpersonal interactions. The quality, methodological quality was mixed, was acceptable, but not a lot of good studies. But these authors concluded that these sort of approaches show that you can improve the mental health of workers if you improve interpersonal skills of their supervisors. 
Nevertheless, when you examine the articles that were reviewed in this study that have the better methodological design that use experimental design, then you find that um, those interventions really didn't have any effects. And lastly, the last theory I'm going to present it, which is based on improving the skills of the supervisor, uh, making a supervisor better, is a family supportive supervisory behaviors. So it was developed by one of my colleagues in, the, um, in my university in Oregon, Leslie Hammer. And uh, this theory is based on social support theory. There are four types of social support. The first one is emotional. The idea is that a supervisor increases their way of showing appreciation, understanding, of being more compassionate, uh, to offer informational um, support. So they help their workers on knowing how to do something, how to access our resource. Then appraisal is uh, trying to get the supervisor to offer feedback to the worker or advices and instrumental help or support is when they offer something tangible, for example, more uh, more personnel, more people working in the same team, more time, more tools, etc. Et something that is tangible. In this theory of FSSB, they also emphasize the fact that the supervisor needs to model and show by role modeling um, the proper way of working and they need to take the collaboration of their employees in order to solve problems collectively. One of the, well, these principles are not only specific for work, family work, uh, for work and family balance, but they can be adapted to other type of interventions. And I selected this study of Dr. Hammer, where this is very interesting because the employees are, are, are special because they are veterans that are returning to civil life. They work as, to work as civilians. And in the United States, veterans have a lot of problems to be reintegrated to civil life. And so in this intervention, what they did was training a certain group of supervisors to be more supportive or support this better veterans in a better way. So here you can see the topics of the workshops. The intervention was based on a training uh, by computer, a computer training with these topics. And uh, additionally, the supervisors were asked to keep a journal to see how they were you know, providing support to the veterans. And the fact is that this intervention after nine months found that veterans that worked in places where before the intervention, a supervisor was more supportive, the intervention improved the situation in, in, those, in those cases. But if it was an organization where the supervisor the supervisor in the baseline did not show any support, then the intervention didn't have a lot of effects. And so this brings us to our summary of this technique. As I mentioned, one thing is what correlational studies show, and another thing is what we see with the um, interventional studies. So carrying out an intervention is a lot more complex than uh, doing a survey. And uh, really, the evidence is mixed. Training supervisors on how to be better supervisors is something that can improve themselves, the supervisors themselves, but the effect on workers is not conclusive. And that's, this brings us to a selection bias because people who are already good supervisors are going to become better, but it's a lot uh, harder to turn a bad supervisor into a good supervisor. I do think that these are soft skills. These uh, communication techniques are important because they show that supervisors care about their health and um, well-being of the workers, and this is going to create trust and show the values of the organization and that. Uh, those are noble, noble ends. But however, they, this all needs to be translated in concrete changes, in changes that are going to reduce stress 
causes. And as I mentioned, there's still the need of evidence in industries that are non-white color. And so this brings me to the last point with this I'm, I'm going to finish, which is the last tactic, using the supervisor that is using the power each supervisor has to change in uh, work stressors. Throughout the cycle, you have listened uh, a lot to a lot of talks regarding which are the main causes of stress in the workplace. They include excessive job demands, low control, uh, safety hazards, and relational problems, conflict between work and life, and um, job insecurity. And this is what the epidemiological evidence says is what causes stress and as a consequence in the long term health problems in workers. If these are the true causes of stress, then the solutions should try to improve them, right? And these are precisely the starting point of the integrated approaches. This is the paradigm of Anthony Lamontagne, which is one of the international uh, experts in work health in the workplace. And what's important here is that, as you can see, the other two strategies were based on the person of the supervisor, whether it was on what they knew about mental health or their interpersonal relationships here we conceive the supervisor within a system. And the supervisor is the intermediary between the upper management, people who truly have power on the organization, people who make decisions on how to allocate resources and where the organization is going, and people who work for that organization. So the supervisor is a bridge between those two levels of power. And supervisors, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the entry point or the facilitators or sometimes people who can make it impossible to, for people to access resources when they So an integrated paradigm shows that occupational health care is uh, occupational health is not only risk management but also leadership and being a good leader and uh, positive health, which is the strategy. What strategy number two was uh, focused on and also the medical part because where when uh, mental health problems are intense they require medical attention so this integrated approach also is the base of the model of total worker health and i think that you already listened to this by dr laura ponet i'm not going to take up a lot of, of time talking about this the principles of, of total worker health, but it's the integration of topics that were not considered uh, occupational health before. With things that have traditionally been part of occupational health. But as I mentioned at the beginning, the pandemic has shown us that there is nothing old fashioned for, for occupational health. It is more, um, more, present than ever right now. NIOSH with their model has tried that any occupational health problem is a classic exposition to um, occupational hazards are approached from this hierarchy that you learned about from Laura Panet. So to finish, these are the conclusions of a systemic review of several interventions, organizational interventions that were carried out in the healthcare sector based on supervisors. And for you to have an idea regarding the type of interventions that were focused on supervisors, they could improving interpersonal skills, what I mentioned before, but it also includes this time techniques to managing work uh, burden and time. A more concrete event is uh, an example is this work family and health network. It was an intervention that was carried out in the United States, an intervention that was developed in the technology sector. 
And it was an intervention where they met with supervisors, they imparted some education, but they also carried out some workshops to reduce two things or to change two things so that each supervisor could establish how to improve or increment control over the working, the hours each worker worked. This was before the pandemic where the idea of working from outside of your schedule or working from home was more controversial. Um, so I'd like to have that control on the schedule. And the second one is to have uh, control on low value work, which are things that take a lot of, up a lot of time, like meetings and stuff, but that they don't actually add value to uh, They don't advance the mission of the organization and they don't create skills for people. So after a year, the intervention um, had different results depending on the gender. So for women, they were benefited by this sort of uh, intervention on their supervisors, especially women who were responsible of a care of uh, small children in their houses. In other words, it, supervisors who were more receptive to improving the control of the schedules and reducing things that were not actually important or bring any value, that strategy improved mental health of women who had were responsible of taking care of kids in their in their house. And now to finish, this is what I'd, I'd like to be my, what I bring to the table in a couple of years. So this is a study we're going to carry out in the following five years, uh, financed by NIOSH, and we're going to intervene supervisors of hospitals, primary health hospitals, with the aim of reducing burnout in their workers of, of these hospitals. So not, not only clinical workers, but also nurses and doctors and um, all of the staff, people who make appointments, um, all of the office staff as well. And what we're going to carry out is based uh, is this is based on a pilot study where we recognize the context, the general context of the healthcare industry that has a lot of structural pressures that end up generating burnout. But we intervene on the supervisor for two reasons. First is because it's the person that has more daily contact with the supervised, with the employee, and, and as such has the ability of making concrete changes in the lives of people. And the second reason is because structural changes where systemic changes are, that's where we want to be, but doing that transformation, it takes up a lot of effort, includes a lot of parts and actors that have different interests, interests and uh, sometimes conflicting interests. So a systemic change is necessary, but it is really, really hard to achieve. While the daily reality of employees is something that we can we feel is easier to manipulate in, in the good sense of the world. Um, so what we've discovered is that in, in clinics or hospitals where supervisors meet regularly with their employees, one-to-one, face-to-face, -to, -face, to hear what they like from the work, what they stresses them, what's keeping them there, in those hospitals, burnout is a lot lower. And we discovered this in a hospital, in the hospital where I work where they reduced burnout from 42% to 24% in one year. And when we saw these results, we asked, what did you do? And what they did was a meeting face-to-face -face between the supervisor and the employee uh, every month or two weeks where they just discuss what they like about their work, what is stressing them out. And then the supervisor can decide, okay, let's do this or let's do that. Let's change this. For example, let's try to provide a better desk. Let's try to make you work from home. Let's try to solve an interpersonal conflict you're having with this person. Let's try to change your schedule. And things that cannot be changed, well, at least are documented and acknowledged that that's something that's causing stress to the employee. So what we wanna do is using this practice so that little by little, the supervisor can start to generate systemic transformations and it's not just an individual approach. 
In summary, and we are over time, I'm sorry, uh, organization interventions that are organizational are a lot more likely to improve the mental health of workers. And as I mentioned before, systemic transformations are necessary, but may take up a lot of time. Uh, while if we directly approach a supervisor, we can have a more immediate impact. However, supervisors alone cannot fix organizational causes. They need the help of other committees, of other, for example, upper management or people who have more power. And especially they need to act based on what they listen to, what, what they hear from their workers. To conclude, I want to recognize that there are some topics I didn't talk about today. I did not talk about the job context or political context or public policy context of a country. Of course, I didn't mention anything about Colombia. And here we know that there are high levels of unemployment or job informality where supervisors may base be based on that to have a more authoritarian style. And then there are not enough resources to try to implement a workshop uh, that's comprehensive like this. I didn't mention either the impact that um, unions have in collective negotiation. And I didn't mention where there are strategies that come from the bottom up when it's employees who participate in the design of uh, work. And there's a very big need to see if colored people, for example, if ethical minorities in the workplace or people who have been discriminated before, even by their supervisors could benefit if supervisors receive training or try to change their way of supervising and organizational stressors. So I want to thank Viviola for the invitation, Sebastian and my colleagues of, of my university. And so now I'm going to get Olivia with this. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much. So we're going to move to questions and answers. So our colleague Viviola is going to help by moderating this part. And Viviola, I do have a question. When you see the, the chance, I want to ask a question to David. Well, then start, Sebastian, and then I can organize the rest of the questions I have received. Okay, perfect. David, again, thank you very much. My experience and my work regarding this topic has been associated with evaluation and diagnosis. And I have read regarding this topic, especially interventions. And I agree with you because the work with leaders is a very important work that have, can have a lot of impacts. And so one of the questions I want to ask you is, part of what I have read, especially in a company that I like a lot and that I follow with, with Google, they say, okay, what we have found with throughout all of the analysis that I've carried out is that it's more effective. Uh, it has a higher cost benefit relationship to invest most in selection processes than in training processes and skill developing processes that you take for granted a person should have. And this, so they created a general rule that is their effort is for selection and their budget for training cannot be more than the budget for selecting personnel. So I'd like to know what's your opinion regarding this, because you have worked with supervisors that are or already are supervisors and where you cannot control who ended up being the supervisor. Yes, that is a really good perspective for this topic, because if you select the profile of the people that you are hiring, if you select a certain profile to potentiate the organization under certain principles or values, then of course, at that entry point, you already are going to be winning. And um, if it's a 
transparent process where values are clear, where if it's, I mean, I don't want to create trouble here, but I, I think two things. If you leave people outside, but could, uh, for example, talking about the discrimination, racial discrimination, a lot of uh, processes are not neutral and a lot of people are left outside, people who, because they are color people or they are ethnical minorities. So if the selection process is transparent, that is a very good warranty. And uh, secondly, I think that even though you select the best profile, you have a good match, that doesn't mean that throughout the way there are not going to be any troubles. Yeah, the, the probability is going to be reduced, but in a, such a competitive environment, so much pressure, the so probability of uh, mental health problems and stress are there. So that does not excuse people from being vulnerable. And so there's where, in any case, you need to provide help. Thank you, David. Y ahí algunas preguntas. Okay, David, here we have a couple of questions and uh, other comments. The first questions that we have have to do with something that I want to highlight from your presentation, and I want to bring attention to this, uh, which is you presented especially interventions that have been evaluated because very frequently we find that people do recommendations and give recipes of do this and do that, but in the end, you don't know really because some things you think may be really good or in theory sound really efficient or that they are going to be good solutions. But finally, in the end, we don't know if they actually are because they are not evaluated. And sometimes when we see things like the ones you were talking about, yeah, they do have effects or they don't. So I want to highlight this something that usually is not done. And here I have a couple of questions that I think are open-ended questions that I, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer because I don't know if there's enough evidence. So for example, someone is saying, how can we assure that training for leadership can be materialized in evident behaviors when they exercise their role? And, and someone else is asking in the same direction, taking into account the interventions you talked about transformational leadership, this sort of treatments, how effective are they really in the organizations? I, I think both questions, I, I don't know if the evidence can answer this. Well, regarding your comments, one of the things that surprised me the more, the most while I was preparing this presentation is that there is so little evidence regarding the impact of the theory of transformational leadership transformational leadership. This is one of the theories that in every type of, every class of organizational psychology is taught. But then I was surprised when I saw that really at very little interventions. Um, and, and we know when we are in this world, the change in organization is really, really hard. So there's one thing is to carry out a study where you evaluate if a supervisor has certain my characteristics and another thing is to try to improve the behavior and the knowledge and attitudes of a supervisor that's a complexity level that's a lot higher and regarding the second point of your comment or of the, that person's comment to conclude a supervisor should facilitate the access to resources or change things that they can change. Those are the two main things that I'd, I'd like you to take home from this, from my presentation. Change what you can change. And in this study, what I'm doing with the check-ins where every sub direct supervisor met one-to-one, -one, face to face with their employee and they said, okay, what do you like? What don't you like? And most of the things are things that can be changed. I'm talking about the desk is too uncomfortable. We're then by a better desk. Um, my cubicle is too dark. Okay, we'll improve the lighting. 
more complicated things such as um, my commute is uh, longer than an hour. So let's explore um, things that don't really require systemic transformation of public policies and the Ministry of Work. No, it's just day to day things that are within the control of the work. And the second thing is I need a day for myself. How can I take a day off? Things like that to facilitate resources. Other projects that I carried out for a long time had to do with something similar, which was maternity leaves and paternity leaves, which in the United States are pretty scarce. But some organizations such as Google, for example, and uh, these sort of organizations that are more prestigious in the United States or have more resources, they offer their own policies for uh, maternity and paternity leave, and they have a res uh, human resources department that uh, are in charge of this, but it's the direct supervisor, the one who receives all of the questions of workers on how to access these uh, maternity or paternity leaves. So if you carry out this training on how to access these licenses, instead of sending someone to human resources, people are a lot more likely to actually take the leave, especially fathers, because, because of, of the labor, there are biological um, reasons that those biological mothers need recovery time, but it is very important that men uh, get involved in, in, in the care as well. And they don't usually take the paternity leave because they are uh, afraid there are going to be retaliations, they can lose their work. But if a supervisor supports them and tells them, this is your right and it's good for you to do it, then that person is going to take that license. Whether there's a whole resource, human resources arsenal to facilitate this, is the direct supervisor who can facilitate this. So I'd say facilitate resources and change what is within your control is minimum thing you should expect. Viviola, I'm really sorry, but uh, what you are talking about right now, if I may just say something about this, how guarantees change in, in people? How do I guarantee that the supervisor is going to actually change? That's really hard to answer, but in my experience in, in organizational change, I have found that there are things that will do guarantee it. It's easier to, to answer what doesn't guarantee that something happens than answering what does guarantee. And part of what doesn't guarantee it is thinking that uh, transformations are carrying out activities. Transformations are not going to happen just uh, after a couple of activities or after a talk or after a training, an isolated training for a process. Human behavior is really hard to change. In my experience, only talks is not going to work. It need a whole process. And it will work if we don't have a real and evident commitment of the higher management and more than just a verbal commitment because I have participated in a lot of processes where, yeah, they say something, but then uh, in their actions, they don't actually do it. And so in those cases, I've, I've tell them myself, okay, it's better if you don't say anything, but that your behavior is uh, according to what you are presenting. So if there is really a uh, commitment with clear behavior that is indicative of their committed, that has a very important effect because what it tries, what the worker tries to do is guiding their conduct or their behavior to what is important to the organization. So if for the organization it's important that people don't have accidents, that don't get sick, then I as a director, I'm going to do everything I can to achieve this. Of course, it's not just talks, but not just PNL or coaching. No, it's processes of systemic transformation that require a lot of time and investment that at the beginning are going to be more expensive than the return you're going to have, but that in the long term, the return is going to be a lot higher than if you don't do anything. I agree 100%. And this is something that also surprised me. Most of the evidence is based on interpersonal relationships, communicational skills. And that's important because you don't want to have a supervisor that's going to be rude or don't recognize the work. That's important. But all of this needs to be translated in concrete changes. Something else that surprised me is that a lot of supervisors don't 
have the baggage of carrying out, for example, a field work. And, and I work uh, talking about uh, the healthcare sector, maybe in other industries that are more, well, maybe not but supervisors in the hospital, for example. Uh, besides the training and communication and everything like that, we also give them techniques on how to continually improve, how to establish goals, how to monitor them, how to establish indicators. And this is all written, you need to document it so that there's an accountability because what you talk about, it just stays in the air, right? If uh, what Sebastian was mentioning, it's really important that if people who have mo the most power in the organization are not in the same page, then all of the effort is going to be in vain. Yeah, and this has to do with a couple of uh, inconveniences that a lot of people are mentioning here regarding some supervisors. They say, on the one hand, they think that it is very interesting uh, having time to talk with collaborators and doing some of the things that you are talking about in your proposal. But here, someone is saying, we have less and less time for this. We don't have time. So yeah, talk to your workers but how, when, they don't give us the time to do that. And there are other talking about people who don't recognize that they need the training, they don't acknowledge that they need to learn. So what do you do with a person that doesn't do things right, but is not willing either to learn or improve or, or to recognize the problem? And I think one of the things is, of course, if there is not a support from the top management, it's going to be harder. If the top management is committed, uh, there are ways of, of doing it, right? Oh. Yeah, David. Yeah, go on, David. Yeah, it's real pressure, time. Uh, in my experience, well, two things from my experience. First, working with hospitals in ergonomics, for example, musculoskeletal uh, disorders of nurses that have to leave patients and can't get hurt. One of the barriers is that it, it's a lot quicker if I do it manually than if I go get the lathe to use the machine. But when we have observed and, and measured the time that the procedure actually takes when you do it in a more healthy way, the difference in time is really minimal and consequences are, you, you can avoid all of the negative consequences. So this is an example. One thing is the perception and another thing is when you actually, actually measure the time. So when you, and these things really add value. So if you wanna make the time, reduce things that are not creating value, such as meetings or things that could have done by email or well, there are a lot of things you can, um, redundant things that you could avoid and make the time for what's important. And the second point is that mental health and stress are manifested because of many different reasons and, and that's going to take a toll eventually. So if you don't stop them, if you don't stop and decide to invest time in things that are going to create value and reduce a lot of problems, then of course, something you need to do. David, here I have a question. Something you were talking about, I didn't mention it, but someone wants to know if you can briefly talk about the impact that, have, that unions have in all of this mental health process. But I imagine in leading, in confronting mental health. Yeah, it's something I didn't talk about. Thanks to unions, we have a lot of worker protection and unions, especially when you try to change something at work, you need to check if it's allowed or even if it's got the support of the syndicates and the unions. A lot of these changes, for example, an example I can give you from my study in hospitals, a lot of changes in schedules cannot be carried out because the syndicate, the union, 
has already packed a lot, uh, an amount of hours that need to be respected and cannot be reduced, even though members would like to. So what I want to mention is that unions, yeah, um, open the way a little bit to negotiation. And anything that you want to do, in my personal opinion, is that you always need to check with the unions what are their perspectives and policies because this is going to delimit what can change and what cannot change, especially things that have repercussions on the salary of workers, so reducing or increasing the working hours, for example. So this is the only thing I want to say. Syndicates, unions, and certain organizations, um, your money over margin is going to depend on one, on collective negotiations. But of Thanks to unions, we have a lot of protections right now at work. Yeah, and there are a lot of things that have been achieved because of unions, because they cannot be achieved in individual fights. One individual cannot achieve certain changes in work. While when you have a collective pressure, which in Europe, sometimes they talk about how working conditions in Europe are the best in the world. It's because of the pressure of the syndicates and the unions. While unions have been, um, stigmatized and demonized, uh, considered negative in a lot of parts of the world and prohibited. And people talk about unions with, um, with <laughs> certain fear, but okay. Uh, David, I have two questions regarding if you have suggestions of a survey or a way of evaluating leaders, or if you can offer people some sort of literature so that they can learn more about leadership. Yeah, I can share this through Sebastián or through you. A lot easier that way, but it's what I'm telling you. Um, regarding leadership, there's a lot of literature, but what we don't have as much is evaluations of programs with evidence because changing a leader is, is too complicated so that's why i think that even if it eh, at least if it's changing a little bit of the knowledge converting a, a bad supervisor if you're a good supervisor is just a lost fight quickly i'm just going to mention the evidence that sometimes supervisors are not bad because they want to be bad but because they have never learned about their the impact their work has on others. I experienced well, I a lot of, of years that I was a member of the um, Convival Committee in the university. I don't know if you know this. In Colombia, law establishes that organizations need to have a coexistence committee to study possible cases of, a, of um, possible, possible abuse cases and almost always when people felt abused people, it had to do with leaders most of those cases were leaders where if you make them uh, acknowledge that people perceived their behavior in a different way they say oh my god i didn't even know why this was happening a lot of people don't follow models regarding what being a boss should be if my bosses were like this and I should be like this and they have no idea and certain times people are too open and receptive to learn. Of course, there are people who don't give a damn, they just think of being uh, the tough boss is uh, the one that gets the results. That's how you do need to do and just, um, but my experience in this eight years that I was a member of that committee was that that was no yeah, the majority of cases. So I think that as you are saying, changing people can have an impact, but it's not the biggest one or not necessarily the more effective, but you can try something. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Viviola, and the documentation that uh, David is going to share with us. Uh, we'll put it up in a web page the bibliography and all of this. Um, yeah, you'll have it available as soon as David sends it to us. Okay, we have four minutes and um, I'm going to suspend the questions because most of the things that I have here are more comments of thank you and uh, 
offering examples, for example, of what we're talking about in the sense that they share a lot of the ideas we have presented. But because today is our last session and we have three minutes, I'd like to take the opportunity to carry out a small reflection for our participants. I'd like to highlight four things that we wanted to make evident throughout the cycle and that were presented throughout different talks really quickly. The first thing was making sure and having the evidence that stress, psychosocial work stress can really generate serious um, health problems and physical problems. Bosses and organizations uh, remember the law that protects uh, physical health and people have trained, are trying to think about physical health. And there are problems talking about uh, mental health. It's important that we need to think that physical health and mental health can both be affected by these sorts of risk, uh, psychosocial risk factors. Some of these problems do not show up uh, right away, yes. Sometimes they take months or years to show up, but that doesn't mean they don't exist or are not important. And they can end the life of someone and they can kill a company as well. That's something that we need to uh, The other thing that we'd like to highlight that preventing stress is not carrying out interventions at a personal level. We need to create working conditions that are not stressful. We have highlighted in every single presentation interventions at a personal level or individual level. It's not that they're not useful or cannot be done. It's just that they are not the most effective line of actions. They are complementary to interventions that need to be carried out in the organizations who are the main responsible and the only ones that can change work stress. And to design interventions that are going to be effective, you need to take the time and think among everyone, especially eh, everyone involved, what's happening and uh, how can it be solved. And I'm talking about directives, employees, and someone who is a mediator, uh, so, someone that knows about it so, to think uh, and help make a decision. And finally, something that David showed very well today is that. Uh, to prove that interventions work or not, it's important to measure the results in terms of health, in terms of economic impact is the only way to improve and having evidence of what, what actually works and how much it works. We have a lot of evidence of organizations that do think a lot of things for their best of intentions, but they don't evaluate them. So in the end, you don't know if they actually worked or not. And this is why the invitation is, if you carry out any type of change, even if it's changes that are not aimed at improving or then, then you can measure what's happening with the health of people to see what sort of organizational changes are producing what type of effects for are not used to that and the invitation is that try to measure what things you're carrying out in organizations and what's the impact they have these small reflections are going to be available as well in a, in a document to us and it's going to send to us next week. But I, I'd like to, to tell you, this is the central message. You have all of these talks available so that you can watch them and rewatch them. I know not everyone has have been able to attend all of the conferences, but thank God you have them available online so that you can rewatch them and start your own uh, process of change because it's going to take time and uh, surely a lot of you are going to have questions that I hope you're going to start to consolidate in your professional practice. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. Changes, uh, nothing in life happens from today to tomorrow. The, what's important is having the conscience of that then you have to do them and actually try to do them because for the good, for the sake of our workers and for the sake of the companies. Sebastian, I don't know if you want to add anything else, but before Sebastian, I want to thank uh, David again. Thank you so much. I It was a pleasure. I'm so glad I could convince you and get you into these topics. 
you're doing a wonderful work and I'm sure in the future you're going to carry out a lot of very important work and that's a really good representation of Colombia in the United States. Thank you so much, David. Now it was my pleasure. Thank you for your invitation. I really, this is something, that what, you, what you did in this cycle is remarkable. I'm sorry uh, that my tongue got a little bit twisted sometimes talking about talking in Spanish and with my slides in English, but I see we have 300 people and, and that is a lot, a very, very inspiring. And I wish you the best in your professional activities. And uh, in the middle of a pandemic, because here we're thinking uh, this is over, but it's not, your work is a lot more important than before. So continue doing your hard work and I desire the best for you. Yeah, Viviola, I'd like to say a couple of things. Well, of course, again, thank you. And I want to also thank very specially everyone who decided to attend and um, give their time to the information and training cycle. Of course, I also want to thank you, Viviola, because uh, your support and, and for facilitating the fact that, that this was uh, a reality and Peter and Aire Lesura, because without Sura, this event couldn't have been possible. And of course, all of our guest talks there our guests who decided to come here and give their lectures because this is a unique a unique event uh, at least in Latin America having been able to reunite all of these professors that we were able to have yeah Sebastian can we tell a little secret when we started thinking about this we said um, this is unique it would be interesting to have here people like Cara Secret Secret I always said, well, let's invite them. The worst thing that can happen is that they say no. And it turns out that these people found that what we were thinking was so special and unique that they accepted. We were the first ones to be surprised that uh, people who we know are number one people in the world uh, because they are experts and they're because of their very important work. They took the time and participated with us with the condition that they could connect all of these conferences with their own pages because they believe that it, what we're doing is important and that this is going to allow to educate people not only in Colombia but in other places of the world. So Karasek and Secret, Laura, Peter, everyone is connecting this cycle of talks with other pages in the rest of the world. So a lot of people who talk Spanish, speak English and Spanish can have access to this information that we have uh, created here. So that was a secret I just, we had, but you already know. Yeah, as I explained this to my family, they say, Sebastian, what are you doing? What, what's that every Friday you're doing? And so I just tell them, okay, this is as important, it's so important that the people who are there are the equivalent in technology to Bill Gates. So we have really important people in the world of uh, psychology that decided to come together and decided to share in, a, in one cycle all of their knowledge. And this is why this cycle was so important and I, we hope this is not the, the last one. And of course, uh, we'd like to have everything recorded and available so that you can rewatch it if it has been like, and by in the name of Arele Sura, I just want to very specially thank all of the companies and our guest um, speakers. And as I was saying, I hope that this is the first one of a lot more spaces we're going to have in the future. Thank you, everyone, and I'll see you next time. David, hug. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye. Buen trabajo.